So here's intentional. You, you, you make a spill knowing that somebody can come by, slip, fall, hurt themselves, right? But you keep on walking. That's intentional. Unintentional. This is injury from unintentional. You made a mess. You clean it up. But you didn't clean it up all the way. So there's still a little bit some wetness on there. Somebody comes by, walks, slips, falls, breaks their wrist. That's unintentional. Your intent was to clean it up and make sure that nobody got hurt. But in doing so, somebody still did get hurt. Okay, that's negligence, that's unintentional. All right? So can you still get sued even if it was <laughs> unintentional? The answer is yes, but it's not as bad as someone who, who wanted to do it with some, um, with some intention to hurt somebody or injure somebody. Okay, and it happens a lot in, in also in radiology. For example, an example of unintentional radiology would be of that of not shielding somebody during a radiation exposure. I tell my students, regardless of age, because you're only supposed to shield a patient in childbearing years, okay, because radiation has effects, biological effects, in the eggs and the sperm cells. I tell them to shield everybody. So that way you don't ever, ever forget. You shield everybody. Even shield the old people, because we know why you're shielding them, but they don't. And if you shield them, they think, oh, they care about me and they're protecting me. <laughs> okay, you're not really doing that. You're not really protecting them because there's nothing to protect, but we do it anyways. Peace of mind. Peace of mind. So, that's an example of unintentional, where you know radiation is gonna, gonna hurt them, but you just forgot to shield your patient during exposure, and they can come back and say, you know what, I was two weeks pregnant, and you didn't shield me. Is that a lawsuit? Yeah. Could be a lawsuit. Yeah. Question for intentional versus unintentional. Say you spilled the coffee and mm -hmm. you notify cleanup or whoever, like janitorial services, then for whatever reason they didn't get it to it in time in order to clean up the mess. Is that considered unintentional? Or it's unintentional? still considered unintentional. Because you would But to prevent to that from happening, I probably wouldn't have left the area yeah. until janitorial services got there. Just curious. Right, right. Now, when janitorial <laughs> services got there, because I did my part, I stayed until they got there and they cleaned it up, but they didn't clean it up all the way. The now it's on them, them, it's not on me. That's <coughs> actually a good point. Okay, so intentional misconduct. Again, it's a purposeful deed committed with intention of producing some consequences. The first one here is assault. Now, it is common that these terms, assault and battery, are used interchangeably in our language when in fact they are very separate and discreet. They're very different, okay? An assault is a threat. It is a threat of touching in an injurious way need not be physically touched. But oftentimes when you hear assault, you think somebody has actually been physically hurt. Assault is just an intent, an intention to cause harm without physical touch. And that's why when we're doing procedures, you're always going to explain what you do. Number two is battery. Now battery is unlawful touching of a person without consent. Okay. In radiology, it might be a needle. It might be the insertion of a rectal enema. It might be insertion of a vaginal probe and in, in transducer in ultrasound. If you don't communicate this to your patient, you're going to get a lawsuit, okay? Because you did not get consent, you did not get permission. Communication is key. With this kind of consent, you would have to get it in writing though, right? Okay. A consent is something in writing, okay? okay. <clears throat> what is after the procedure? How do you get proof that you already told the patient, but like if they don't want to sign it? If they can't, if they don't sign the consent, you don't do the procedure. They do it after, isn't it? Before. Have to no, they should not do it after. Okay. If they do it after a procedure, <laughs> okay. 
that is that is here's the other thing too is <clears throat> we have patients coming in who gets uh, who gets medicated okay if they have been medicated and you're talking to them about the consent of what we're about to do we can't have them sign the consent form because they don't have it all the way here they may be sedated they're, st they're still communicating with you but they're not 100% with you if they're not 100% alert and awake they cannot sign that consent. <clears throat> and if they do it after, it's against the law. So in that case, you'd have to have them come back for the procedure. You take them back, you take them back. If they have been, for example, if, like this, and what I'm talking about, if they have been sedated, <coughs> take them back to their room. You let the medication wear out, wear off, and then you bring them back, okay? But not while they're sedated, and not after <coughs> the procedure. <laughs> I have a question. How does that work in the ER? They shouldn't have done that. Yeah. Yes? Huh? How does that work in the ER? Oh, I'm going to get to that. Okay. The question is, how does that work in an ER? I'm going to get to that. Okay. False imprisonment is to detain a person against his or her will. <clears throat> For example, you don't let them leave or inappropriate use of restraints. Okay? So if a patient refuses an exam, <clears throat> Okay. We can talk to them a little bit more. I'm not going to give up on the first time they refuse because it's poss po possible that you just didn't understand what's going on. Okay, So I'm going to explain, re-explain the procedure. And they refuse. And I'm going to do a little bit, try a little bit harder for them <coughs> to get to understand. If they keep refusing and they want to leave, I'm going to let them go. I'm going to block the doorway. <laughs> okay, go ahead. Okay. <coughs> There's actually a term for that. It's called AMA, Against Medical Advice. Okay. They have to sign out on that too? No, they don't have to sign out on it. They can or cannot. If they keep going, you just put on the chart. They left without, you know, they left against medical advice. Patient refused. Okay. Inappropriate use of restraints. You cannot restrain an individual for the same reason you can't give drugs. To an individual, you need a physician's orders. Just like oxygen, you need a physician's order. Using a restraint, you need a physician's order. You get a physician's order to put a restraint on, you get a physician's order to take the restraints off. Okay? Otherwise, that's false imprisonment. Is that the same for immobilization devices? Immobilization devices is a little bit different because all you're doing is you're just temporarily immobilizing them to do an x ray. And that's where you would communicate with the patient why you're not advising them. Okay. Uh, invasion of privacy. We talked about HIPAA. Confidentiality of information has not been maintained. Or the patient's body inappropriately and unnecessarily exposed or touched. Invasion of privacy. This can also be an overlap over here of battery. Okay. In x-rays and also ultrasound, the patient will be moving around in different directions. <coughs> they're only wearing a gown. With all that movement, sometimes you're going to flash us a thing or two. We, what we want to do is we want to maintain modesty. Okay, So although we have them undress, we still want to keep them covered as best to our ability and so it doesn't interfere with the procedure that we're conducting. Also, it covers the liability of using pictures without permission. I have talks often with the radiology students about Instagramming, doing Facebook, okay, taking selfies, <coughs> making sure that there isn't anybody around them that violates any type of HIPAA. Okay, liability of using pictures. All right, deformation of character. Deformation of character is disclosure of info. To, un, uh, to authorized <coughs> persons only, disclosure information of authorized persons only. If info is negative for patient's reputation, two things can occur, okay? Because it is a defamation of character, two things can occur. One is libel, the other one is slander. Libel is defamation through, uh, through writing, and slander is defamation through speech. Now, can you be accused of libel or slander even though the statements are true. The key here, here is defamation of character. 
How many times have we walked into a conversation, okay, right in the middle of the conversation, and you think you're hearing something, take it out of context. and you take it out of context? Those are half truths. So there's some truths to it. But what you've done here is you've defamed the individual's character. So you can still be accused of these things even if the statements were true. Okay? All right. So unintentional misconduct or negligence. Again, negligence is an unintentional tort. We're talking about civil lawsuits here, right? So again, one here is forgetting to protect a patient during exposure. <coughs> Negligence is professional malpractice. Neglect or omission of reasonable care or caution may result in monetary compensation. So again, here is reasonable care. Reasonable care. <coughs> Communication is key in minimizing any type of liability. I took this out of one of the hospitals where I have a contract with. I, I saw this up on the wall and I said, man, this is some good stuff. I'm going to take a picture of it. Okay? So what they've done here is they've used this acronym, AIDIC. It doesn't even flow. It doesn't even make sense. It's AIDIC. Okay? But the acronym is AIDIC. A, to acknowledge. Knock on the door and verbalize the patient's name. Okay? You want to make sure that you've got the correct patient. Acknowledge. I, introduce yourself, your name, your title, who you are, what you do. D, duration, how much time needed to complete the task or procedure. So you're going to explain what you're doing and how long it's going to take. Again, we're communicating. We're trying to limit the amount of liabilities that can occur. We're trying to avoid uh, invasion of privacy, we're trying to avoid false imprisonment, we're trying to avoid assault and battery. Those are the most common things that can happen in the radiology department. Explain, <laughs> part of duration, communicate what and why uh, the procedure is being done. And I like this one, T, thank them after the procedure, thank you for your time, come again. <laughs> okay. Oh, yes, <laughs> All right, so communication, and I'm going to, again, next couple of weeks, I'm going to be spending a lot of time in communication. All right. So for malpractice to occur, these four things have to be proven. There are four of them. The first three is pretty easy to prove. It's the last one that's very difficult to prove. So number one, that the person or institution being sued had a duty to provide reasonable care to the patient. Well, we work at a healthcare facility, isn't that our number one priority? So that's easy to prove. You work in a hospital. Number two, the patient has sustained some loss or injury. Well, they can prove that there may be a loss or injury. Okay? There may be no contest to that or argument to that. The person or institution being sued is the party responsible for that loss. Well, he was in my care, she was in my care, or it happened here in this hospital. That's also easy to prove. This is the one that's hard to prove, is the loss is attributable, attributable, the loss is attributable to negligence or improper practice. So again, it's an omission or neglect of reasonable care. Very difficult to prove. Okay. To cross the line from civil to criminal negligence, there must be a gross or flagrant deviation from the standard of care. Of care. Okay, so you can have civil and criminal negligence. Did you, hear, did you guys hear about that doctor who was, um, I think he was in Torrance. Um, he was prescribing different types of narcotics to, to patients without prescriptions and things like that. Xanax, Norco, a whole bunch of really addictive prescriptive drugs. He was, a, he was actually a doctor. So they, run, they ran a sting operation on this guy. And so they would send individuals uh, of law enforcement agents that were going there, um, posing as patients and why they need the drugs. One of them showed up as, um, she was a DEA, and she showed up as a, a stripper pole dancer. And she was saying, I was having all these back pains from, you know, from stripping. She says, can you prescribe me some drugs? She said, yeah, sure. And he did this without even examining her. 
Okay, and this is where he got caught. This was happened for years, but <clears throat> the straw, <laughs> okay, the straw that broke the camel's back was one of them showed up, and he had brought X-rays of him from the chiropractor or somewhere where there was some back x-rays done on him. He showed it to the doctor, but the x-rays were that of a dog. <laughs> oh my God. He was looking at it and says, mm, yeah, yeah, it looks like you're having some problems. <laughs> yeah. And prescribed that drug to the DEA. And that's how, that's, that was the clincher. Okay. So that went from civil to criminal. Wow. Yeah. There was a doctor, lady doctor in San Diego last year that she did the same thing. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she made money from the pharmacy that, you know, she was prescribing all of this medication. So mm -hmm. she made millions of dollars right. because of prescribing all of this right. medication. And that, that happens all the time. I, you know, and I'm going to use this term very loosely because I knew somebody who was a nurse who was doing that. He was, he was stealing narcotics from the cath lab. And then selling them out in the in the streets. It's the same thing, same thing. <laughs> and so, but I didn't know about it till after. Okay. Otherwise, if I knew it during during, now violated some kind of ethical conduct. <laughs> That's what I'm claiming. To be silent. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> to be, be silent, silent is just just as guilty. Just as guilty. Yes. All right. So the term respondent superior. So that means any actions that any conduct that you have ultimately is also the responsibility of your employer. So this is all what it means. And with that said, if you ever get sued, not only do they go after you, they're also gonna go after who? Your uh, boss. Your employer, your boss. Now, I'm gonna talk about this later on, but let's just talk about it now. So when you get sued, you can actually get sued twice. You can be sued against the, uh, the, 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 uh, the people who you felt like they were violated, but your employer can also go after you for their losses against, against those people. So you can actually get sued twice. And that's why it's important for you to get yourself liability insurance. So when you guys become student technologists, the district does provide you. you guys, did you get yours? Insurance? I'll, I'll do, yeah. yeah, okay. So the district does, does provide you with liability insurance. Okay, you guys are covered. However, you should get a little bit more. So get an additional liability insurance on top of that. Did, did Ms. Smith tell you about that too? Not the additional one, just the okay. first one. Okay, so I'm going to tell you. So in addition to the one you're getting from the district, you should also get one um, outside of that. They can't come up to your house, okay. your car. And exactly, because when you get sued, when they get sued, they're going to want to look at financial statements. They want to know how much they can get you for. So they're going to go out, like you said, they're going to go after your car, your, any, any type of title. So your car, your house, your boat, your motorcycle, whatever, your timeshare. They're going to find, they're going to find out what you have and they're going to go after that. All right? So it's always good to carry two insurances. Okay? So again, um, <coughs> You can lose your license. You can lose your license from stealing drugs or equipment, practicing medicine without a license, working <coughs> under the influence of drugs and alcohol. I've known people who got fired for doing this. Okay? Abuse of body treatment, including molestation. Negligence in patient care. Felonies or misdemeanors would result in termination from the hospital, possible conviction and sentencing and termination of licensure. Now, something interesting here is that when you guys become technologists, your name gets part of, it gets put in a registry, uh, a data bank, if you will. And every year, the society, the American Society of Radiologic Technologists, the ASRT, you also have one for uh, uh, the sonographers, which is the ARDMS. They, annually, they put a list of technologists out there who have been banned from practice or have lost their licensure based on one thing or another. And it's always funny when I see people's names that I recognize. Yeah. Some of them also former Cypress College students. Please don't be one of them. <laughs> I'd rather see them from another school, not from Cypress College. <laughs> All right, Good Samaritan laws. 
Are you guys familiar with the Good Samaritan law? <coughs> they exist in that when you see somebody when you see somebody in need or medical need, these laws protect you from trying to save their lives even though the results were not <coughs> positive. All right? Because they would rather that you attempt to save somebody's life than just walk away. So these Good Samaritan laws protect you from that. Okay? Even so, then, because I know when I got my CPR license, they were saying, like, yeah, you know it, but outside of work, you shouldn't really practice it just because of the fact that they can one, sue you. And well, yeah, you I mean, you don't, yeah, you don't make it. until somebody yeah. else relieves you. Yeah, you just don't, in other words, you also don't make a practice of it. Okay. You know, like a vigilante. <coughs> gotcha. Yeah. Okay, going to informed consent. We already know what informed consent is, right? And informed consent is providing the individual with enough information about the procedure that they're going to have so they can make an informed decision to have it done or not done. Okay? Now, there is a general blanket consent that the individual gets when they enter a facility. It's just basically you're entering a, a medical facility, so these are the things that can possibly happen, but it's very, very general, so you got to sign a form saying, yeah, I'm okay with that. And whatever you want to do with me, I'm okay with that. It's general. However, when you get into a more specialized department, let's just say surgery, this blanket consent is not going to be good enough because they need to be more specific about the procedure that you're going to have done. So there are more specific consent forms that the, the individual gets. It happens all the time in radiology if you're having a CT done, if you're having anything done with iodine, the consent form becomes even more specific not only uh, listing the benefits, but also the risks of that particular procedure. Now, going back to what you were asking me before, what happens if the patient comes through the emergency room? Well, you have somebody coming to the emergency room with, uh, uh, as a gunshot victim, uh, traffic accident, stroke, fell off the building, they're not here, they're unconscious. What are you gonna do? You're gonna stand over the gurney? Well, hmm, I'm not sure, but he didn't sign a consent. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Yeah. Well, what do you think? Should no what, what do you think? Should we do anything? That's up, up to you. Okay. What now comes into play is what's known as a I forgot the name of it already. Where is it? Oh, implied, here it is. Implied consent. Implied consent. Okay, it is implied that if somebody comes up to your comes into the emergency room and they're unconscious and you need to save your life, we're going to work on you to save your life. Okay, it's implied. It is implied that you want us to save your life. It's implied. Now, with that said, is that always the case? Okay, because we've got attempted suicides to come in all the time, you save their lives like, damn it, I was trying to kill myself. Why'd you save my life? But it's implied, okay? <clears throat> so that's what happens. I'm spending a lot of time on this because you think it's gonna be on the test? Yep. Okay, implied consent is gonna be on the test. <clears throat> We've already talked about the reasons for charting. The whole purpose of why we chart. The whole purpose of why we chart, number one, is to, to minimize the amount of medical errors and duplicate procedures. It makes the transition from one caregiver to the next smooth and seamless to minimize these type of errors. The information can also be used for medical research. But mostly, not only to protect the patient, but you're also protecting who? Yourself. You're protecting yourself. You know what CYA means? Doesn't mean see you later. It means cover your assets. You're doing this to cover your assets. You 
creating a paper trail. So if there is any litigation that comes about, you've got the paperwork and document, documentation that demonstrates that you were within your scope of practice. Sorry, I can't breathe. <coughs> okay, any questions? So this is what a general consent looks like. You guys can, can look through that. All right. Films are part of medical record and may be used as legal evidence. So the information that you generate okay, within those images should include all this information because it's part of the medical chart. Name of patient, date, the procedure, the time, the facility in which these images were taken. Your name should also be on here. Okay? All these things must be on the record. Now, if this is film, or even, I'm sorry, even, um, even computerized radiography, because we've got to clean out the archives every, every so often, you want to keep the images for seven years for adults and until a child reaches maturity. So if you're an adult, we're going to maintain your medical images for approximately seven years. Same as taxes. Same as taxes. Billy? Yep. Now, if you're a child, we hold on to it indefinitely until you become an adult. That's going to be on the test. Okay. All right. <coughs> Incident reports. Incident reports. Remember that, that, <coughs> that guy who came by slipped on that spilled Diet Coke that you cleaned up but didn't clean up very well. So when that happens, there's paperwork. It's called an incident report. And in this incident report, it is going to describe what happened, who was involved, who was there, who was it reported to. Okay. So it's going to be a documentation of all these different things. Who, what, where, and how. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. Who, what, when, why, where, and how. Okay, it's an incident report. The whole purpose of this incident report, and this can also be utilized when a patient goes into an anaphylactic reaction. When a person goes into an anaphylactic reaction, we're filling out these incident reports. Who, what, when, where, why, how. how. Okay, so you fill out an incident report, and it needs to be it needs to be reported to your immediate supervisor, wherever they may be. So you follow the chain of command. Okay, so you fill out the report. It gets uh, reported to your immediate supervisor. The whole purpose of an incident report is not to punish you. It is to make sure that this incident doesn't happen again. Or what can we do to minimize such an event from occurring? This is what an incident report is for. So that's only for um, anaphylactic shocks that happen within the hospital? It can be for anything, anything out of the ordinary. Okay. Anything out of the ordinary. We can even fill out an incident report if someone loses their wallet, <laughs> losing a hearing, their, uh, I'm sorry, their earring or hearing aid goes missing. If there was a fall, if there's an injury, okay? If I've seen this happen too. Is sometimes the patient may be moving around and they, their skin tears on the table. Okay, or it gets caught in the mechanism. That happens too. You gotta fill out an incident report. Things that are out of the ordinary, whether there is injury or not, you still have to report it. Okay? This is part of remember why I said CYA? This is part of CYA. So if anybody comes back and says, okay, well this is what happened and you know so and so was involved. They're going to say, okay, they're going to look in the files and see if there was anything filed out. <coughs> and if there isn't, now you're in trouble because it's your word against his or hers. <clears throat> All right, guys, this is where I'm going to stop. This is where I usually stop. You guys want me to keep on going? No, no I'm good. No. <laughs> All right, let's get out of here. <laughs> so next week... Next week we have, yes, I have a couple of lectures.
uh, a couple of extras. I'm trying to get as much as done next week, beginning with Maslow over here. Okay. Every time I see him, you guys know the Three Stooges?